The one who does the work does the learning. That's what Terry Doyle said in his book, Learner-Centered Teaching. My guess is that every teacher watching this would shout a hearty yes and amen to that statement. Preach! But even though we very much believe in a learner-centered approach to our classrooms, the practical implementation of it seems to elude us. The cultural and historical inertia of hundreds of years of teacher-centered classrooms is just too strong, and so to fight it seems impossible. And so we teachers resign ourselves to doing the work and just hope that the students do some learning. But in this video, I want to talk about Harkness discussions and how they might be the key to a Copernican revolution in our classrooms, namely getting the teacher out of the center and getting the student into the center of our AP history and AP government classes. First, let's begin with a definition. And by the way, much of what I'm saying comes from the authoritative book on the Harkness discussion published by teachers at Phillips Exeter Academy, where the Harkness method was developed. But seeing as how that book is north of $100 on Amazon, yeah, I'll summarize the findings here. So what is a Harkness discussion? It is a student-led discussion, Socratic in its form, in which students sit around a table so that eye contact and collaboration is encouraged. Now, the good folks at Exeter have the blessing of small class sizes, and for them, no more than 10 to 12 students will be around the table. But we humble school teachers who live in the real world of 35 student classrooms will have to modify that for the implementation. Now, the idea here is that teachers become listeners and guides supporting student apprehension of the material rather than the one at the center flapping our mouth holes. The teacher becomes less an instructor and more a partner in the human enterprise of education. Therefore, a heart this discussion is based on two fundamental assumptions. That the instructor has selected appropriate materials and is well versed in the content, and that the students are quite capable and motivated enough to study the material presented to them to arrive at their own interpretations and conclusions, and to bring these to class for an intelligent conversation among peers. And then he said students will be motivated to do their own learning. <laughs> I know how that sounds, but listen, I would argue that much of what we experience as lack of motivation actually arises from the teacher-centered model. In that model, we're asking students to participate in our drama according to our rules, to find fascinating what we find fascinating, etc. You know, some students are happy to dance to the choreography that we have written, but many are not. Harkness is a way for students to take agency over their own learning. And one of the English teachers who wrote a chapter in this book said it magnificently. She said, when we understand something, we own it, and the pleasure of ownership is visceral, not merely intellectual. The ideas that are dearest to us, ones that become internalized and useful, are the ones we have struggled personally to build. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that Harkness discussions are worth considering in your classroom. Now let's get into the practical matters of how to execute them. The discussion begins with us teachers. If the conversation isn't going to be a flop, careful preparation is necessary. The Harkness discussion will always have as its subject some text or a group of text or central ideas chosen by the teacher. Now, this is not as easy as it sounds. One text can create the occasion for the most magnificent discussion anyone has ever had in any classroom in all dimensions discovered and undiscovered. And another text is going to create a 50-minute nap period. Therefore, the goal is to select what an author in this book calls a sexy text. I probably don't even have to tell you what a sexy text is. You know it when you see it. It's a text that ignites intrigue and curiosity or doubt and confusion. In my A-Push classes, a staple document for me is a lengthy excerpt from Abraham Lincoln in his debates with Stephen Douglas. In it, he talks about how he really has no problem with slavery and would would not seek to abolish it where it was already legal. He also talks about how he's not entirely certain that the white and black races are equal. And that, my friends, is a sexy text. Students are going to read that and they're going to go, wait, Abraham Lincoln said that? And that leads the students into all kinds of pursuits, like exploring the free soil platform and trying to figure out what changed between Lincoln-Douglas debates and the Emancipation Proclamation and the nature of political speeches and on and on and on. It's like electrifying. So choose sexy texts. That's first. But I can almost hear the objection through the screen. Like, yeah, how would they know about the free soil platform and the rest of the context that would make such a discussion meaningful? Well, here's where I tell you that you also need to pair that primary text with secondary text that help them fill in the story. For me, most of the time, that's going to be textbook reading or videos or, you know, whatever. That way students have more grist for the mill than just the primary document or documents that we're considering. And if they come up with a question that was not answered in the text that I assigned, then they have their textbooks right there in front of them and they can consult them at any moment. Now, I begin our Harkness Day by explaining the ground rules of the discussion. First, I remind them that the one who does the work does the learning, and that's the why of this discussion. Second, I tell them they need to address each other and not me. Third, I tell them that they cannot behave like turds in the discussion. And I go over a few turdish behaviors like criticizing people or dominating 
dominating the conversation, but ultimately I just tell them a turd is a turd and you know one when you smell it, so just don't be that guy. Now, once we get into the actual discussion, the teacher's role is pretty minimal. Teachers are responsible for guiding and assessing. We'll talk about assessing in the next point, so let me just tell you what I mean by guiding. And I should tell you now that in this book, it's repeated over and over again that there is no definitive Harkness method. And this is coming from the teachers whose whole world is defined by Harkness. So, you know, adapt the method to your context. In a perfect world, the teacher would never contribute to the discussion at all. In that world, the students would rise up and take hold of the responsibility for their own learning outcomes and then leave the class feeling as if their humanity had been enlarged. But this isn't a perfect world. So a teacher's main role in these discussions is to get the discussion going with a well-considered and intriguing questioner, sometimes to summarize the student's contributions when appropriate, and to direct students to consider comments that need more discussion. And look, unfortunately, you can really only learn by experience what level of intervention is appropriate when. Some discussions require almost no intervention, others much more. But you have to learn it by doing it. But I would say start on the non-intervention side and see how it goes. So in my classroom, I would begin by posing a question and then I would just sit back and let the students go. And often this comes with a great deal of silence and hear me now, you have to be comfortable with silence. My great temptation is to believe that the silence was an indication of boredom or you know non-interest, but more often than not, the silence was more an indication of needed space for the students to think and to consider what I just asked them. And, you know, once someone started talking, the silence was often over for the rest of the discussion. So don't break the silence, it is a good thing. I mean, probably 20 minutes of silence is a problem, but five minutes is not. Remember, almost no teacher in their entire school career has given them agency over their own learning, so it's going to take them a minute to figure that out. And then really the only other thing I'll do is that if I can tell about halfway through the conversation that they're veering off course in an unfruitful way, then I'll summarize what has been said and then ask another question to get them back on course. And that's really as complicated as it gets. Now, you may agree with me on the efficacy of this model, and that's great, but the real question is, how do I assess a Harkness discussion? And the truth is, I've seen as many ways to do this as there are teachers, but I'll show you how I do it, and then I'll point you towards a couple of tools from Exeter that might work for you. I've tried all kinds of complicated ways of grading these discussions, but ultimately I landed on this. I would write everybody's name on a piece of paper, and then they would have a rubric in front of them that showed them the kind of questions that I was looking for. And there are two kinds of contributions that would score points, assertions and questions. And then there were three levels under each of those roughly corresponding to Bloom's taxonomy. Level one indicates a basic question or assertion, level two indicates an intermediate question or assertion, and level three indicates a complex question or assertion. And if you want to know the difference, level one makes me go, good. Level two makes me go, interesting. And level three makes me go, what? And here's how I translate all of that into a score. Every student gets a 60% just for showing up. And if they do nothing for the rest of the conversation, congratulations, easiest 60 points you ever earned. Each level one contribution is worth five points, each level two is worth 10, and each level three is worth 20 points. And so as the discussion goes on, I'm just writing below their names, the levels of their contributions, and in the end, they have their score. Now, down in the description is a link to two discussion tracking tools that Exeter has published on their website, along with instructions for how to use it. But at the end of the day, you just have to use what works best for you. And the next place you should go is to this playlist right here where I have other videos giving you tips for the AP classroom. And if this is your kind of thing, then subscribe and come along. Heimler out.